Let's Take This Outside with Marianne Iveson, the podcast where she speaks to athletes, outdoor professionals, and scientists about why they connect with nature. Dr. Joanna Young is an environmental educator with over a decade of experience leading backcountry expeditions for youth. She is the director of Alaska Programs for Inspiring Girls Expeditions and a co-founder of the Girls on Ice Alaska Program. Joanna is also an expert in glaciology who studies how Alaska's glaciers are losing mass in climate change and how that impacts communities downstream. Altogether, Joanna's work has the unifying goal of using research and education as vehicles for social justice and inclusion towards environmental sustainability. Enjoy this fantastic sciencey chat with Dr. Joanna Young. Joanna Young, welcome to Let's Take This Outside. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. So this made me laugh because right before I hit record, we were talking about recording in closets and recording in, you know, whatever space we can find. But it's the most outside thing possible that you're like, I have to move the sleeping bag in this room or this closet because it's rustling. (laughs) It was this kind of perfect way (laughs) to introduce you. I am literally sitting in uh, what we call our gear closet right now. Yeah, I'm surrounded by tents and sleeping bags, and it's the most quiet space in the house, but it certainly doesn't look very luxurious. (laughs) And it's so good for sound dampening. I just want to point that out, too. Good. (laughs) Joanna, I interviewed your sister, Hilary Young, who works for Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, and she recommended you and your work, and I started looking you up, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I have to chat with Joanna. But first of all, how do both siblings end up in environmental work? That's such a great question. I love this question. And in a way, sometimes I I don't feel like I'm in environmental work. I feel like Hillary is doing, you know, real conservation work at the front lines, talking with stakeholders and community members and Sometimes it feels like I spend a lot of time behind a computer doing really data heavy stuff, but you're absolutely right. There's a lot of outreach and education component to my work as well. And that's really what I love. So I'm just really jazzed about this opportunity to talk with you today. But I think I wonder if, if Hillary and I can trace back some of our environmental interests to the way we grew up, which was uh, both of us were born in uh, southern Ontario, the suburbs outside of Toronto. And I think it was a fairly, you know, suburban upbringing, but we had parents who were teachers. And so the wonderful part about that, as well as being really excited about learning, is that um, they had June and July off. And so <laughs> we used to, or July and August. So we used to move to our family cottage and live there for the whole summer. And that was a little bit further north in Ontario and on a lake, boat access, and just peaceful, quiet, and surrounded by nature for two months. And I think that that's probably where so much of the love of our environment and natural landscape probably grew from. I could almost copy paste Hillary's <laughs> answer to your answer <laughs> about, uh, you know, spending time in nature. And remind me where it was again. It was like in cottage country, right? It was in cottage country. It was in what is now the Kawartha Highlands Provincial Park, um, but it wasn't a provincial park at the time. And so we were, our property was kind of grandfathered in, which is wonderful because it meant that there could be no further cottage development. So it remained a very peaceful spot for mostly for recreation. I want to talk about the science aspect of your job. You're a geoscientist and glacier expert, which is so freaking cool. Also, I love talking to scientists because I have no concept whatsoever. So I I always learn so much from scientists, obviously, when I have them on the show. Also want to talk about inspiring girls expeditions, but uh, you're currently on satellite internet right now in Alaska. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, I am in the gear closet of our home in in Fairbanks, Alaska, which is uh, in the interior, uh, quite far away from the coast. So we are just below the Arctic Circle. Daylight is shrinking away for us right now. It's uh, getting into November. And yeah, we're in the middle of the boreal forest. And it's just it's a beautiful spot. 
So how far are you from like a Tim Hortons or like a McDonald's or like a Costco? <laughs> You know, we, these stupid. Sorry, not Tim Hortons, not Tim Hortons, <laughs> not in Alaska. Like a chain coffee shop or or something like that. <laughs> Probably uh, fifteen minutes from a Starbucks, so actually not that far. But it's quite easy oh, that's to get. Not bad. <laughs> it's quite easy to get far out into the woods and and have a home that's on. Oh, I don't even know how many acres our property is. I, I think it's something like fifteen. So yeah, it's pretty easy to get out into the woods. Lovely. This isn't going to air for a while, but this coming weekend would be daylight saving here in Ontario anyway. So we are gaining an hour of sleep and it's going to be, I think, lighter earlier. How much light are you going to get over winter? We are lucky because we're a little bit underneath the Arctic Circle. So we never experience full darkness. Our shortest day on December 21st, we have three hours and 41 minutes of sun above the horizon. And that might sound really short, but the <laughs> I mean, it is the good silver lining is that the sun angle for us is so low on the horizon that the sunrise and sunset are really, really long. You know, it's not just the sun coming up and going directly back down. It's this long, just gentle angle above the horizon. So we have probably still about seven hours of usable daylight on that shortest day. So it's not too bad. But you do feel it. And summertime, we have exactly the opposite. You know, we never reach full darkness. The sun sets for three hours, but we're still still very dusky. And so we really make up for it in summertime. So it balances out year round. But yeah, we're entering into sort of the hard part now. I'm going to ask the basic questions here. What does a geoscientist and glacier expert do? A geoscientist is someone very broadly who studies the Earth or processes in the earth, uh, different aspects of this planet that we live on. And a glacier scientist or glaciologist specifically looks at glaciers. And so we are in a community called cryosphere scientists. And cryosphere is just a fancy term for like the frozen parts of the world. So that can include people who study snow or sea ice or... Uh, you know, other frozen forms of ice. And yeah, glaciers happens to be the particular feature that I study up close. So how does one go from the suburbs of Toronto to <laughs> way up in Alaska studying glaciers? Like, how does that even happen? <laughs> I wouldn't at all call it a linear path. It's been quite circuitous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it took me a long time to find my way here. Yeah, as I mentioned, started really interested in in nature, really excited about being outdoors. But I went into my undergraduate at UBC, British Columbia, in, of all things, physics and astronomy. I was really interested in the night sky and sort of thinking big picture about the universe. It was a wonderful subject, so fascinating, but I kind of quickly realized that if I continued down that pathway, I would be setting myself up for a life behind a computer all the time. And I really missed being outside and connecting with nature and and being in natural landscapes. And so I, (laughs) to connect it back to my sister, she was working on her PhD at the time that I finished my undergraduate, and her PhD was in ecology and biology. And so I worked as a field assistant for her, and we were sort of tracking the behavior of deer and moose in the Canadian Rockies in Kananaskis. And I think this was kind of the moment where I was like, okay, how can I combine what I've already learned and love in the world of physics with getting outside and being in these incredible places? What is the field science that you can do with a background in physics? And I dabbled a little bit here and there, but I ended up meeting a glaciologist or someone who studies glaciers. And I just really felt at that moment like I'd found my people, you know, and so Folks who are science geeks like me, (laughs) but also environmentally minded and really into the outdoors and mountain landscapes. And it just felt like my community. I felt like I found my pod. And so I ended up going to graduate school for glaciology. And that's 
what brought me to Alaska because here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, we have just an incredible glaciology group. Can I share with you my favorite? <laughs> this is what this is what nerdy outdoor people say. Can I share with you my favorite glacial experience? <laughs> yes, please. And I wonder if you can relate to this or maybe you can give me some kind of context on it, but it felt kind of almost a little bit out of worldly. So I was up in Jasper. Can you guess what glacier I went and saw? It's got to be the Athabasca, right? <laughs> I don't know if it's called that. It's the one at Mount Edith Cavell. Oh, maybe I don't know that one. Really? Okay. So I'm trying to think what it's called. It doesn't matter. But <laughs> I decided to go with for this hike with some friends and we go up and it's, I think it was my first time seeing a glacier up that close. And it was almost like a spiritual experience for me because you were seeing something that's so beautiful and so, so old. And like, I felt connected to it. Almost. I know that sounds really nerdy and weird, but there was something about the glacier specifically and like the energy around it that I was like, whoa, this is a super cool place. And also very sad to see, you know, of course, there was a diagram that showed how much it was melting and over the last how many years, right? So there's a sadness along with like this really cool connection to it. I, I know that sounds kind of weird, but not at all. That's so neat. I mean, I definitely feel that kind of experience now when I visit glaciers, but it's <laughs> it's really wonderful you had that on your first interaction with the glacier. My first glacier visit was kind of a liner note. I, I visited a really, really popular glacier that kind of has a lot of tourist activity. You know, it's like easy to see, easy to get up onto the ice. And I was with a couple of friends and we were quite young. And we were just goofing around in this, in this beautiful place, pretending to be mountaineers, you know, while we're dressed in jeans and sneakers, like the worst possible outfits for this environment. And, you know, I had no sense of the fact that these features would come to play such a big role in my life down the road. It was really funny to think back on that first experience, which was just fun and lighthearted and really, you know, pretty straightforward, just a tourist visiting a cool thing. But <laughs> I've come around quite a bit more to sharing more like your experience. Yeah, feeling this, this just really strong connection to these features. You sent me a really cool picture that I might, I might post along with this. But what is it kind of a day to day look like in a glacier expert's life? I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to paint it with you know, I really got rose colored lenses, a sexy glacier <laughs> brush. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, there are really cool aspects to getting into the field. I'll talk about those in a moment. But a lot of what I do does end up keeping me behind a computer these days. There's quite a bit of, you know, data analysis, data processing. I do a lot of computer modeling as well. And so that's just like using this sort of fancy software to to sort of analyze the data and, of course, writing. So all of the things that a typical scientist does, I also do. But the sort of, you know, 5% of the year that are by far, you know, the most exciting parts that draw people into this field, I think, are those moments in the field and in the mountains. The ticket that we get as glaciologists to access these incredibly remote corners that people just would otherwise not be able to get to either for logistics and challenge of getting to these locations or for the expense of doing it. You know, we require often helicopter support or I've landed on glaciers in fixed wing airplanes on skis. And, you know, these are the kinds of things that just aren't open to everybody by any means. And so it is a really wonderful ticket to get to these places. And I mean, frankly, very privileged to be able to do that. And then you get dropped off. This is the amazing part. You know, you're in a town, you're packing up the airplane or the helicopter with all your bags and your food for a week or two weeks. They fly you into this spot and then 
they leave and <laughs> you're there with your team in the middle of this vast landscape. And it's both incredibly exciting and very intimidating, you know, especially if the weather is kind of starting to blow in or anything like that. And it's just, it creates such a sense of focus, I think. And yeah, focus on the task at hand, getting set up at the camp, getting comfortable, checking the area from a safety perspective, making sure you're in a safe spot. And, and you just get, get down to work. And the work really is 50% just living in this harsh environment, in the snow, in the ice, in the mountains with, with what can be pretty crazy weather. And then maybe 50% trying to get your data, trying to get your measurements. So it's an experience both in data collection and just in kind of like extreme camping <laughs> sometimes. And But man, I love it. It's just an exciting place to be. And, you know, you're out there with a team of people who you really trust and communicate with and, you know, set up a really positive tone and constructive work dynamic before you go out and then you're all there in it together. And it's just, it's a remarkable experience. Joanna, you, you said that being a glacier expert is not sexy, but all I'm imagining is you like hanging off a helicopter being like, land there. <laughs> and then like, you're in like the harshest environments in the world and like the middle of the Arctic. And you're like, it's not sexy. It's not, it's fine. Whatever. I'm just behind a computer. I'm just imagining you like James bonding it off a, off a helicopter. <laughs> I have yet to do that, but you're making me think I should really try to accomplish this before before too long. <laughs> Let's Take This Outside merch is now available, like toques, sweaters, and t-shirts. Head to letstakethisoutside.ca and hit the store button to wrap your favorite podcast. Thank you so much for supporting. To make it easy for my little brain to understand, are you measuring glaciers melting? Are you measuring their movement? Like in the easiest way possible, what are you measuring? What are you gathering for data? That's a great question because as much as it might seem like a narrow thing to study just glaciers, you know, one feature of the world, Glaciology is actually a really broad discipline, and there are a lot of different aspects of glaciers that you can study. So it's not a simple question. And the aspect that I study the most closely is what we call glacier mass balance, or looking at how glaciers are either, you know, shrinking or growing or staying the same over the course of time. And of course, globally speaking, you know, we're at a point where 98% of the glaciers uh, globally are, are at a point of shrinking, except for a couple sort of outliers that are fortunate enough to still be growing. But in, in climate change, we, we are seeing, of course, globally just uh, massive rates of, of mass loss, uh, glacier ice loss. And so what I study is looking at how some of the glaciers of Alaska are doing in terms of how they've been shrinking over the past several decades. And I also look at what that means for the rivers downstream of these glaciers. And so rivers that here in Alaska might run through communities that live in the proximity of these features. And, you know, for them, it matters what these rivers are doing in terms of whether they are uh, seeing more meltwater because the glaciers are shrinking more whether the timing of the water entering into the rivers is changing because we're seeing earlier springs and sort of later falls and that kind of thing. And so looking at how the rivers downstream of glaciers are, are changing as a result of climate change just has a lot of potential impacts for communities and, and for infrastructure downstream. So when I'm in the field, what I'm doing is collecting data that will tell us how the glacier's mass loss is occurring. And so I'll measure things like how much snow has entered into the glacier system over the course of the winter. So that's, you know, really straightforward measurements, uh, digging snow pits, which any folks who are familiar with digging into snow for the sake of looking at avalanche conditions or something like that, they'll probably be familiar with 
with what that's like. Um, so digging a hole into the snow, which can be, you know, up to eight meters deep in some places. So it can be a kind of activity that takes you all day <laughs> to see how much snow has fallen over the course of the winter. And then I'll also look at how much melt happens over the course of the summer months. And so that usually involves placing just a giant glorified stick or pole in the ice. And to do that, you use a steam drill, which is this crazy backpack propane fueled steam powered drill that just like uses steam to drill a hole into the ice. And you drill a hole and you place a very, very, very long pole, maybe 10 meters long and measure how much of the pole is sticking out of the ice, you know, at the beginning of summer, and then come back and do that again at the end of summer. And you can see from that very simple measurement how much the ice has melted. So these are kind of point measurements. And then uh, once you have those, uh, that's when the, the computer work comes into play. And you use those point measurements in time and space to feed into the software and get a bigger picture of how you can extrapolate that over the whole area. So those are some of the basic but like really important measurements that I do when I'm in the field. This question might be a little <laughs> hard to answer, but what does glaciers melting mean for our world? Oh my gosh, that is like such an important question. And the amazing thing in my world, being among all of my colleagues who are looking at similar aspects of glaciology, is that I feel like we learn something new almost every week about what glacier mass loss means for the world. And it's just incredible the number of ways that glaciers are connected to our Earth's global climate system and to our ecosystems as well. You know, there are ecosystems around each of these glaciers that are specifically adapted to thrive in these environments. And people might think immediately of, I don't know, ice worms, you know, that's a really specific creature that lives on a glacier. If you've ever heard of them, they're these tiny little inch long worms that live in the ice, which is very cool. But it's not just those aspects of the ecosystem that I'm thinking of. It's much bigger. You know, for example, here in the West, so much of the Pacific Northwest depends on salmon as a subsistence species and as a cultural species that are so important for food and for cultural meaning for people's lives. And that's certainly the case here in Alaska. And salmon choose where they're going to spawn in rivers and where they're going to you know, spend their time as fry, depending on things like water temperature and water clarity and uh, water chemistry and all these different sort of characteristics that are determined by the presence or absence of glaciers in the headwaters. And so there's a lot of interest in knowing how salmon are responding to the loss of glacier ice. And it's very complicated, but they are just one of the species I think of when I think of how interconnected the ecosystem is to what's happening with glaciers. And then, of course, stepping away from even ecosystems, like you said, you know, the topic of sea level rise is something that everybody has heard of. And everyone has probably come to understand that glaciers are shrinking so much that they're introducing fresh water that has you know, up until now, it's been locked away in the mountains and that fresh water is melting away and then entering into the oceans and causing the ocean level to rise. And right now, glacier melt is about 50% of the reason that the ocean is rising. The other 50% is just because of what's called thermal expansion. So as the ocean warms up because of climate change, it's getting bigger, it takes up more space, just like you know, air in a balloon, like a balloon will grow if it gets warmer. And so a similar concept, but the amount coming from glacier melt is about 50%. And the current forecasts expect anywhere up to, oh, I think it's five to 10 meters of potential sea level rise, depending on where in the world you are. There's some sort of intricacies to that by the year 2100. 
And well, A, 2100, not so far away. (laughs) You know, I have a 15 month old child now who will be around to see that. And so I think a lot about what his generation is going to experience. And, you know, five to 10 meters, A, that's very large. That's a big amount of sea level rise, you know, especially for communities who live so close to sea level, which is all along the coasts of Canada, the U.S., and of course, everywhere globally. But also it's a really big range, five to 10. You know, there's so much uncertainty still with respect to those forecasts because, you know, it's still up to us as humans to decide how much we're going to continue emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and continuing to, to contribute to climate change. And that's going to have an impact on where we land and sort of that forecasted range. So it's very, very hard to plan for, you know, if you're the city of Miami or like if you're Manhattan, how do you plan for five to 10 meters of sea level rise? And what are the differences between five and 10? It's really hard to come up with a concrete plan until we have a a better sense of the trajectory we're on. The last thing I'll say about sea level rise is just that the latest studies estimate that with those forecasted changes by the year 2100, that we could see up to a billion people being displaced around the world by that sea level rise. That's how many people live that close to the coast and within risk of getting flooded if if they're not to move. And so the issue at hand, of course, becomes that this will be the largest human migration that the globe has ever seen. We've never seen something on the scale of a billion people needing to move to a new spot. And of course, it won't be all at once, but it does really have uh, global consequences for immigration and for human livelihood, humans' ability to, to live and thrive where they are. So I feel like I'm not ending that on a very positive note, but there are, there are a lot of. <laughs> well, Joanna, like when I ask questions like, what does the glaciers melting mean for our world? Like I was kind of hoping you would indulge me a little bit on what that meant. So I really appreciate you going down that rabbit hole with me. <laughs> it is a rabbit hole. I'm glad to go there with you. And from a scientist's perspective, also, it does fascinate me because there are so many ways that we're constantly learning about how glaciers impact the environment, the climate, our ecosystems, and humans, us as a society. Yeah, it's just fascinating. Well, I know that you are doing your part not only as a scientist, but also uh, as a director of Inspiring Girls Expeditions of Alaska, because you are helping educate young women on our environment. What is Inspiring Girls Expeditions, and how did you get involved? Inspiring Girls Expeditions is this amazing, now global um, collaborative of uh, different branches that are all over the place, including several in North America and us in Alaska. And what we offer are very unique, tuition-free art, science, and outdoor expeditions for high school youth. And Here in Alaska, we have three different expeditions currently that we run in the summertime. And each of them goes out for 12 days. And they are small teams of nine participants. And the participants are chosen to bring together this really interesting and diverse group of people who have different backgrounds, different interests, different personalities, just diversity in a whole number of ways. And the instructor teams are professional scientists, artists, and outdoor guides. And as I said, they go out for 12 days. They go out to a very remote backcountry spot and they camp and live and explore that landscape and conduct field science experiments and learn how to do some field science while they're out there. There's also a lot of art integrated in to help complement the scientific process and the scientific observations and sort of look at the landscape through a little bit of a different lens. And then there's lots of skill building in terms of learning how to thrive outdoors and in the backcountry and how to be comfortable and learn how to move through the landscape. And so we have 
a mountaineering expedition on a glacier called Girls on Ice, Alaska. And there's a sea kayaking expedition that's focused on the coastal ecosystem, and it's called Girls on Water. And we also have a hiking and pack rafting expedition on a river in interior Alaska that focuses on the, the boreal forest. And that's called Girls in the Forest. And amazingly, Inspiring Girls Expeditions has branches all over the place now. We've just really grown over the past decade to find a community of other people who are really excited about running expeditions in their own place. And there is a Girls on Ice Canada branch that this past summer ran three different Girls on Ice expeditions in different places in British Columbia and Yukon as well. Is there any way a 33-year-old woman can pass as a 16-year-old girl? <laughs> I feel the same and really wish that there was, for me, like a middle-aged women on ice version because I would absolutely want to attend. <laughs> Millennials on ice, can we start yeah. that? <laughs> And most importantly, what do you get out of the experience of this and helping so many younger women, younger girls of so many different backgrounds and diversity come together for this kind of experience? It's just incredible. So I'm at a point where I've been involved with the organization for 12 years now, I think. And originally, I was instructing on these expeditions as the science instructor every year and spending the 12 days in the field with the participants and just really getting to know them and seeing the transformation in their, sure, their their interest and abilities in science, but also just their confidence and their sense of empowerment and their sense of friendship and kinship with one another for having gone through this just really unique once-in-a-lifetime experience together. From beginning to end, it's just, it's just amazing to see and that's probably what I get out of it the most. Still to this day, even though I'm not instructing, I'm directing the programs now. And so still collecting feedback from them and, and trying to get a sense of what they've gained. And we see all kinds of incredible feedback in terms of what they learned scientifically, artistically, you know, how they grew and were able to expand their vision of themselves as an artist. Even if they don't identify as being an artist, they still come to learn that there are a lot of wonderful ways to express yourself artistically. And then, yeah, like I mentioned, hearing how they've grown in sense of confidence and empowerment and being there. I just work with the most incredible team of instructors and am learning constantly from everybody. These, this community of artists, scientists, and outdoor guides, it, like it combines so many of the things that I personally am really excited about. And so, the learning I get from being part of this community has just been enormous, enormous. Dr. Joanna Young, I didn't realize how much I'd learn about glaciers today, but this has been absolutely awesome. And for us to arrange this when you're like in Alaska and I'm here and you've been so patient and kind about this, I just want to say thank you. And thank you for all your expertise today and sharing that uh, wonderful brain of yours. Thank you so much for having me. This is a real pleasure. And I can't imagine a better conversation to have while squatting in my gear closet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. For more Let's Take This Outside, go to letstakethisoutside.ca. Produced and distributed by the Sound Off Media Company.